Welcome to the Story Geek Show. On today's show, I will be discussing something very interesting. What was Lucifer's motivation for rejecting God? That is an interesting topic from a storytelling standpoint. And then we're also going to dig deeper into episodes four of Tokyo Vice. Plus, we have an official release date for Death of a Bounty Hunter. I'm really excited about that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in this show. This show will have spoilers for Tokyo Vice episodes four and five, so just be aware of that. I am Jay Shear, co-writer of Death of a Bounty Hunter and Time Slingers, and this is The Story Geek Show. Let's jump into Lucifer's motivation first. This was a segment that was triggered by, if you're watching the video version of this, I'm going to hold this up. Door of a Door, Lost Legends and Sagas of Pre-Flood Earth, Volume 1, Creation Angels War. This book is from our sponsors. Door of a Door is a sponsor of ours. It was published by Nova Novus Renaissance, and um, they were kind enough to sponsor our show. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about that comes out of this book, but I want to compare it to um, some of the scripture passages that we see, so sacred texts that exist for both um, Christians. These are coming out of the Bible, and they're coming out of... Uh, the Old Testament portion of the Bible. So this is coming from um, predominantly what would you call Judeo-Christian, Jewish and Christian scriptures, referencing Lucifer's motivation. So we talked about on this show, on the Story Geek show, you know, years back, we talked about Thanos's motivation. And we dig really deep into Thanos's motivation. So one of the things we want to look at is when we talk about characters and what their motivations are for doing things, one of the more interesting uh, ones that we can look at that a lot of people in the world believe is that Lucifer exists and is real and uh, also would be considered Satan, right? Well, what was Lucifer's motivation for even betraying God and turning against God, rebelling against God in the first place? That is what we're going to talk about now. Uh, now, this book, Door of a Door, we're going to compare. I'm going to compare Lucifer's motivation there to what we understand from that comes from Scripture. And I'll read a few passages from Scripture so we have a little bit of context there. Door of a Door is an epic fantasy series about the great war in heaven and the battle between angels and demons, right? So we'll take a look at that a little bit. But basically, uh, it's, an, it's a fictional narrative that is put on top of the information that we see in Jewish and Christian scriptures. So it's a fascinating read, and it digs way deeper into what Lucifer's motivation could have been than we really do get in any sacred texts. Um, the sacred texts, I'll read them. I'll read some of what the sacred texts say. And there's some interpretation. Some people think that other passages are about Lucifer as well. I'm even going to tell you just up front that when we start to read this passage that I have that is about, um, it references Lucifer, I'm even wondering if that's a metaphor, right? Like maybe it's a metaphor. I'm not sure. So it is it's really intriguing to me to look at these things and analyze these things from a story stealing standpoint. Um, let's go ahead and start with the Bible. I'm going to read uh, from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, which is an Old Testament scripture. It would technically fall under Jewish scripture. And then, of course, Christians have adopted that scripture as well. So it is a sacred text for at least two religions. Um, if you are, if you know a little bit about uh, the Islamic religion, let me know if any of Isaiah is covered in that um, book as well. But in this chapter, this chapter 14 begins with the fall of the king of Babylon. And so it's talking about that. This is obviously uh, the book of Isaiah. So it is about the prophet Isaiah and what's going on with the prophet Isaiah. And this whole chapter is mercy on Jacob. So it starts with saying like, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. Right? So it then gets into the king of Babylon, but then so verses 3 through 11, and when I say verses 3 through 11, if you're not familiar with Scripture, basically because there are so much material to cover in Scripture, verses and chapters have been added so that you can reference them, right? So it's like saying like a, cha like a paragraph of a chapter is like a verse. <laughs> and what this is, we're going to skip down to verse 12, and it, and it starts to talk about the fall of Lucifer. And it says, I'm just going to read it here for you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount 
of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Now, the next section of this is Babylon being destroyed, Assyria being destroyed, uh, Philistia being destroyed. So you have like the fall of the king of Babylon. Then you have the fall of Lucifer is what this is. What this portion of this passage is labeled. And then you have the Babylon destroyed, Assyria destroyed. But the interesting part of this is it's talking about Lucifer. What's interesting is let's talk about who the, who Lucifer is coming from the Bible. Lucifer was an angel and Lucifer chose to no longer be an angel meaning in service of God and chose to go do his own thing. And then, then he became Satan, right? Um, and then this passage is talking about, um, you know, Lucifer being laid waste, uh, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What's interesting about this passage is that um, Lucifer is referenced and we do know that Lucifer was a fallen angel that, you know, again, is referenced because in the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible, the serpent who tempts Eve um, is referenced as being Lucifer. But when I read this particular passage, I'm not sure if Lucifer is being used as a metaphor because we're talking about all these other kings in their other kingdoms. And then all of a sudden it throws in Lucifer into this. But then it sounds like Lucifer could be some other king. It doesn't sound like he is, um, you know, necessarily the same character that we're thinking about when we're thinking about Satan and the temptation and and the the angel who's fallen from from heaven. So, I'm not a biblical scholar. Uh, I'm a, I, I, I'm a, a amateur biblical scholar, but I'm not familiar with every single passage that exists in the in the Bible, which is super thick and super intense. Um, and I do think that sometimes when we read these passages, we don't really know exactly what they mean or exactly how they were intended to be taught. And so as I was doing some research on this topic of saying like, well, what was Lucifer's motivation? For those people who believe the passages of the Bible that are talking about Lucifer, the basic story, if we were to deconstruct it, is that Lucifer was an angel under God. He was the most perfect creation of God pertaining to the angels. And yet he chose to reject God and went off on his own um, and took a third of the angels with him. We also know that um, it's referenced that Lucifer is the one that tempts Eve in, as Satan in the Garden of Eden. And what does Lucifer say to Eve in the Garden of Eden? He says, you should eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the one thing they're not supposed to do. Adam and Eve are not supposed to do. And if you do that, you will become like God. So what's interesting here is if we if we look at these passages, we can make an assumption that Lucifer is not unlike what we're told human beings were like because the essential sin of Adam and Eve were that they wanted to be like God. So a lot of people will say, well, the sin of Adam and Eve was that they ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. But that's actually not the sin of Adam and Eve. That's the behavior of Adam and Eve. But what was the sin? Well, the sin was they wanted to be like God. And so why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because they wanted to make themselves the exalted ones, the ones that could rule over everything, the powerful ones. They wanted to their ego, if you will, to be the, the, the ultimate thing in the world. And they thought, it, well... God's lying to us, we can become like him if we just eat from this tree. And that's what Lucifer was doing. He was tempting them. You know, if you eat from the tree, you're going to be like God, so you should do that. Now, if we go into Lucifer's motivation here, and now I want to get into Dor of Ador a little bit too, because Dor of Ador does a pretty good job of unpacking some of what is referenced here in Scripture and turning that into a bigger story, Right. So what are some of the things that it says? Well, it says, for you have said in your heart, speaking about Lucifer, again, unless it's a metaphor for some other king that was on earth that they're calling Lucifer, which is possible, by the way. Um, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will 
also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. When it says Most High, it's referencing God. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit, which is basically like saying uh, you're going to be brought down to hell, right? You're going to be you're going to be crushed. So there is this idea that exists here that it that there there's pride and or hubris that caused Lucifer to say, well, what's preventing me from being like God? So I'm going to be like God. And that's essentially what Door of a Door is unpacking here. Um, and this is where I think it gets interesting. I, th I think, first of all, I think Door of a Door does a very good job of unpacking exactly what this set of verses in Isaiah is talking about, Isaiah, um, talking about Lucifer um, and his mindset, right? I shall be like the Most High. So there is a sense in the Bible that if it's either humans or even angels, those who possess a free will have the ability to say, I don't want what God has for me. I want to pursue what I want. I want to make myself to be the most important thing in the universe. I don't believe that God is the most important thing in the universe. And so therefore, my will be done, and I'm going to go be a creature that, it, that acts like God. Even though I am a created being because God created me, I do have a free will, and so I can put myself at the top level, <laughs> if you will. It's not unlike some of what you might see in some you know, Eastern uh, philosophies that says, like, by our own ego, we put we elevate ourselves into being God, and so we have to kind of reject our ego and live into to acceptance of our position in the world. It's not unlike that. That's the same. It's a similar principle that is shared across multiple spiritual disciplines. Now, it's not it's not in every religion, by the way. Some religions are basically like, yeah, you should fight for your best you, and you should be the you should be the you you are better than other people, and you should fight for that, right? But generally speaking, there's some this spiritual principle where we say we shouldn't act like God. Now, what happens when we act like God? It's actually the the antithesis of the golden rule, right? The the golden rule is um, do unto others as how you would have them do unto you. The antithesis of that is make yourself God because you're better than everyone else. You they should do what you think is right, and it's a completely separate um, way of behaving. And so. What I think that the Bible is suggesting, and again, Door of a Door does a pretty good job of breaking all of this down. I'm going to hold it up again for those of you watching. Door of a Door does a pretty good job of breaking this down. It says, well, how would an angel, this is, this is the essential question from like a writing standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint. God creates angels. God creates the universe at large, right? And it seems to me that angels are at least partially, if not fully, um, bound to the universe. God is not, right? Because God created the universe. So it doesn't assume, it doesn't seem to me, based on my reading of any scriptures, I think a lot of people would say this about God, that God is not confined to the universe. God is extra universe as opposed to intra universe, right? Whereas angels seem confined to the universe. Now, that might not be true. There might be, you know, is heaven in the universe? Is hell in the universe? Are those metaphors? Are those real? Those are all questions that we could be asking. But for a second here, let's assume that angels are definitely under God because God created angels. So here's where it gets really interesting. There was a type of human beings before human beings were in existence because Lucifer chose not to follow God and chose to do his own thing, chose to make himself like the most high. If we're taking Isaiah, literally that Lucifer an angel chose to make himself like God and then tempted human beings to do the same thing. So there's multiple interpretations we could make about this. But the first question we have to ask is why would a created being do that? And I think this is an interesting question because how closely connected were angels to God before 
the creation of humanity. What I'm asking that the reason I'm asking that question is because I think the closer connected you are to God, my assumption would be the less you believe that you could actually be like him. But it seems to me like Lucifer was very connected to God. Now, Lucifer had a lot of power bestowed upon him. He saw himself very highly. Okay, so here's the, here's the real question. What makes human beings and now angels, being Lucifer, what makes them think that they could be like God? Is it just because we have a free will and therefore we can make ourselves like God? We can have the perspective that we want to be like God? Or what is it? That's causing human beings and angels to have this desire to not serve God and actually go serve, you know, their own their own um, desires, basically, right? And so we have to ask ourselves that question. So if you're a Christ follower, if you're of the Jewish faith, I think you you have to ask yourself like, what is this idea of Lucifer, and why does this idea of Lucifer exist? Dora Vidora does a pretty good job of covering this because what Dora Vidora says is. How did Lucifer become prideful in himself? And then what did he do about it? And so there's character development. We don't get the character development in the Bible. The Bible just tells you this is what happened. In Door of a Door, you actually see, you, he, they actually, the writer actually describes this is what's going on. The writer um, is, is uh, Lazarus Fox, by the way. Um, the writer is describing what exactly is going on? How did Lucifer go from being a normal angel to saying, well, not a normal angel, one of the best angels, to then saying, like, I want to be like God, and so therefore I'm going to reject everything else, and we're just going to go, we're going to um, fight against God and, and the rest of the angels. And there's a whole battle that happens. It's very epic, very intense. And I think that one of the things that we have to think about, because this is epic fantasy, this is fiction. Door is fiction. But if you're a Christ follower, if you believe in the Bible... If you're of another faith that believes in the Bible, that holds the Bible to be true, I think we have to ask ourselves, what is it that Lucifer did? Why did Lucifer do it? What's going on there? Because there are passages in the Bible. You can't just say like, well, Lucifer, I don't think exists, and I don't think he actually does anything, and he's, you know, it's not a thing, so I'm just not going to believe that part of it. You can't really do that because there's multiple places in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, where, there, where Lucifer is, is referenced. So don't forget, Jesus was tempted by... So if you're saying, okay, well, that's just Old Testament stuff that tells us about wh how Lucifer came about. Don't forget that Jesus was tempted by Lucifer in the New Testament. Jesus had three temptations that uh, came from Lucifer in the New Testament. And we're told that Lucifer roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, We're also told that he's beautiful, by the way. I think a lot of people think of like Satan and Lucifer and they immediately think of horror movies where it's like these grotesque be these grotesque beings and things. Well, we're actually told that 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 Lucifer looks like a being of light. He looks very appealing to us, right? He looks how he looks like what we might think we would want God to look like in terms of being light and we think that that it's that he's he's attractive, right? That's what we're told. So a lot of people will listen to this and they'll be like, this is crazy. Like, this sounds like a high fantasy. It sounds like Dora Vador just came up with this and it's complete fiction. But you're telling me, Jay, that this stuff is actually in the Bible. Well, yeah, it is in the Bible. So how should we view it? How should we view it? And how, what are the different ways of viewing it? And I'm, again, going to tell you that it's not like I've done a deep study on this. There's probably people that have done a deep study on this. I found it very interesting because Dora Vador was talking about it. And what we do in this on this show is I discuss like what the storytelling elements are, how those show up, and how we should respond to them. And so Dora Vador brought it up. This is what Lucifer did. He rebelled against God. He, he got a faction of angels to fight against God, and he tried to become God himself. So I think the first question, let me just run through the questions that I ask myself and then talk about some of the conclusions we could come to. And this is up to for you to come to your own conclusions, right? But I'm comparing these stories and trying to figure out like, well, what does this mean? So what, so how does this come about? Why do we even have this conversation? Because I find myself thinking, what is Lucifer's motivation? Because 
if I saw God, if I had a connection with God, what would make me think that I could be God? Now, I agree that human beings do that all the time. Human beings think that they should be God all the time. Adam and Eve's story, I also think, is about Adam and Eve trying to be God. I believe that because I can see that exemplified in those around us. I mean, if, you're, if, you, if you were to tell me today in 2022, as Russia invades Ukraine, if you were to tell me that Putin does not have a little bit of a God complex and wants to make himself some form of a God then I'd say you're crazy because it seems like he totally has that. And it, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. We want to put ourselves in the driver's seat. We want to be the ones that are the our own destiny. And so we put ourselves in these places. So on the human side, I can see why humans want to be God. But if you knew God and, and knew how powerful God was and knew that he was extra universal outside the universe. <laughs> I think I just made that word up outside the universe then what in the world are you thinking if you're like well I'm gonna be I'm gonna be God I'm gonna be like God um, I'm gonna make myself like God and we know that Lucifer because of other passages in the Bible that I won't get into right now that I could go look up we know that Lucifer has at times been given extensive amounts of power or freedom to maneuver on earth He's roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Um, now that is about who can he make think that they should be a god. That's my interpretation of that passage, for example. So what is his motivation? Well, his motivation is pretty human in nature. So there is something. Now, I think what we could do, what we could pull from that is we could pull a couple things from that. One, we could reject. Well, one, we could reject it outright. And say that doesn't make any sense. It's totally fanciful and it doesn't make any sense to me. However, I do think that any creature with free will does seem to me to have an innate question on their hands. Should I make myself the most important thing or should I become subservient and say I am not the most important thing? I am a part of a universe. And therefore, I cannot be more important than other parts of that universe. That seems like it makes sense to me. Now, why would an angel choose to believe that if they have a closer relationship with God? That's what I don't know. But here's my, here's my suspicion. Door of a Door does a really good job of explaining how that might play out if, you know, Satan's hubris got the best of him and he started thinking, I could be like God, right? It does a really good job of that. And it might be right on. An alternative take on it could also be that we know God has allowed for free will with humans. We also know that God has, there are portions of the Bible that talk about God's influence over humans and that, you know, uh, he will, God will use human beings, bad behavior to point toward a better way of, um, living and a deeper connection with God. So for example, I'll give you an example. When Pharaoh, the, the, the people of Israel were enslaved by the Egyptians and Moses was leading them out, right? Like he was, he was basically becoming the person that was going to lead them to freedom, to the promised land. Pharaoh, it says multiple times, was given the opportunity to let the Israelites go. And, uh, and he didn't, he kept refusing to do that. And there, there's even a passage that says like God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, right? So did Pharaoh choose that or did God force him to, to not let the people of Israel go? I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make here is we have examples where God will use what Pharaoh was doing to bring about a better understanding of the connection he wanted with the Israelites and so he's using his creation in so that using portions of his creation that have rejected him so that portions that are not rejecting him that are trying to get closer to him will better understand what a relationship with God looks like. So part of me wonders if Lucifer has free will, he decides he wants to make himself like God and part of me wonders if God says, you have the free will to do that. 
And also, this is something that I can showcase to the rest of my creation to showcase how damaging that kind of behavior is. Because ultimately, Satan or Lucifer in the Bible is the ultimate villain in the Bible. There's no bigger villain than Satan is, right? He is the exemplary character of leading you away from God and suggesting that you could be like God. And the truth is, you can live your life as if you were God. Now, I would argue that that is not the right way to live, and that is ultimately um, ultimately bringing about your own hell, your own version of hell. My, I think one of the things that the Bible does really well is it gives us these metaphors. And so I think that Lucifer is por- a partly a metaphor for us of what the ultimate villain looks like. It just so happens that I also think that that's kind of true, meaning the truth of the story of Lucifer is that if we make ourselves like Lucifer and we believe the lie that can exist in our own head that we are supposed to be like God, I think that what can happen is we can essentially create our own hell. Because in my version of things, uh, look what's happening in Ukraine, right? Like Putin is trying to be like God and he's creating a hell. And he's not just creating it for everybody in the Ukraine, but he's also creating it for himself. So this is a specific teaching in the Bible that if you put yourself in the position of God, you can not only create hell for yourself because now you have no hope of being saved because you want your will to be done. And guess what? Your will to be done, if it is, if your will was to be done in all cases and your will was to be exemplified, a lot of people are going to say, well, if I had my will being done, everything would be awesome for everybody. I can tell you right now, I've never met a perfect person. And if you can't be perfect, then your will is eventually going to hurt a lot of people. So if you've hurt a lot of people, even by mistake, then you putting yourself as God is going to hurt even more people. This is the Putin scenario. (laughs) So my ultimate conclusion is, is that door of a door does a really good job of explaining how does hubris lead to putting yourself in the God seat. The other thing I would say is I think that that is a perfect metaphor for devouring ourselves. What are the two um, now? Now I would I would highly encourage you to go listen to um, Timothy Keller, who's a pastor um, out in Redeemer Presbyterian. He, he used to be the lead pastor there. His messages on what hell is and and what Satan's role is in the world are fantastic. What you would assume if you were to watch like, you know, the stories of Hollywood is that Satan is like this evil creature that's trying to cause pain. But what Timothy Keller says is actually Satan basically has two roles or two things that he tries to accomplish, both of which are bad for humans, but they don't seem as bad as you might think. The two things that Satan is trying to do are one, convict you to say that you're never good enough for God and that God doesn't love you, right? Think about that. Think of where like depression and anxiety come from, especially. It's a lot of times you thinking you're not good enough and then it causes you to be anxious or it causes you to be depressed. It has for me personally. I know that there are other ways people get anxiety and depressed. I'm not making a generalized statement. I'm not going into some, I'm just, I'm just saying, a lot of times if we don't believe that we're worthy of God's love, which by the way, we're not worthy of God's love, but he loves us anyways. And Satan's trying to say, you'll never be worthy of it. And he doesn't love you. And if you believe that, then you believe a lie because we're told that God does love us and wants to love us. Right? So that's one thing that Satan does is it convicts us that we're not good enough. The other thing he does is he tempts us in a way that we would choose that we are our own God. So if you think about the things that you would do that are bad for you, that hurt other people, imagine that Satan is tempting you to do those things because why? Because it disconnects you from God because it makes you the God, right? I'm going to go cheat on my spouse because I think it would be better for me. That's just one example. I'm going to go get drunk because I think it would be better for me. Now, these are things we do all the time. And notice how, how they work together. If I say, if I, if, if Satan says, I'm going to tempt you to do the thing that you shouldn't do, and then I'm going to tell you because you did that thing, how far away from God you are and how God doesn't love you. That's a one, two punch, man. That's hard to overcome. 
And so I think that Satan is partially a metaphor. The greatest villain in the, in the Bible is partially a metaphor, and it doesn't make the metaphor untrue. But what it means is, is that we need to look at, well, the motivation for Lucifer to do that was to be like God. And now he's looking for, he's embittered to say, I want other people to be disconnected from God. And I'm going to do two things to do to get it. I'm going to tempt them to be, to make themselves their, their own God, like they did with Eve in the garden. And he does with all of us every day. And I'm going to also convict them that they'll never be worthy of God's love, despite the, the fact that the Bible tells us that God loves us unconditionally. Not only does God love us unconditionally, he actually wants to have a relationship with us, right? That's what we're told in the Bible. So if we make ourselves our own God, then we don't need a relationship with the one true God. Interesting. Really, really interesting from a storytelling standpoint, if you break down some of those things. Now, a lot of people listening are going to go, well, you know, this scripture, that scripture, or they're going to say this is fanciful or not fanciful. I'm not trying to get into those things in this particular video. What I'm trying to do is, as a storyteller, I'm trying to understand the narrative. And I'm trying to say, what do I know about the narrative? What does Dora Vador say about the narrative? What does the narrative in the Bible actually say? And how can we bring these things together to understand what they're trying to communicate to us? So hopefully that's helpful to you. <laughs> hopefully it's interesting to you. I'm curious though, if you address this from a storytelling standpoint, are you on the side of like, this is crazy, the metaphor doesn't even work for me? Or are you saying, actually that metaphor kind of works for me even though I don't agree that that's true? I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. So leave me a comment and let me know what you think. If you want to buy Dorvador, go check it out. Dorvador, Lost Legends and Sagas of Pre-Flood Earth, Volume 1, Creation Angels War. A link will be in the description so you can check that out. Special thanks to them for being a sponsor and for letting me talk about Lucifer's motivation. This, this book dives deep into it from a completely different perspective. But I thought, I want to talk about this because it is a story that a lot of people believe in. So what is it that they believe in? Why? It's worth, it's worth taking a look at. All right, now let's get into episode four of Tokyo Vice. I'll start with a quick recap of episode four of Tokyo Vice. It begins with Samantha fantasizing about owning her own fancy restaurant, much similar to the one in which she works currently. And she even puts in an offer on one of the buildings that she, found, she has found. Jake then gets picked up by the Yakuza and taken to visit the head of the Chihara family, Ishida. Ishida tells Jake that there's a rumor that he's a police informant, meaning Ishida is a police informant, the head of the Chihara gang. And because of that rumor, his men aren't respecting him. He asks Jake then to discover who the informant actually is. And after Jake basically kind of agrees to do that, Sato drives Jake back home, and they have a really funny moment where they talk about the Backstreet Boys song, I Want It That Way, which Sato loves and thinks is a lot dirtier than Jake thinks it is, which, pres which provides some comedy for everybody, which is good. Uh, Jake then talks to Detective Kirigara about the rat in the Chihara gang. Kirigara agrees. Kirigara, if you don't, if you um, if you remember, is played by Ken Watanabe. Uh, Kirigara then agrees to find out who the informant really is. Why? Because if Ishida is killed, meaning the head of the Chihara gang is killed, then the Tozawa gang will go to war. It, because they're the head of the gang won't be very strong. So the Tozawa game will try to take over and that'll be a giant mess. And we know that um, Kirigara is trying to prevent war because it means that the average citizens will have to endure some of the violence from the Yakuza. So one of Kirigara's basic motivations is to keep the gangs from fighting each other. So Jake and his supervisor then go to... Jake and his supervisor from the newspaper, Imi, and I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, Imi or Imi, that he convinces her that they should look into the suicides because he thinks that there's something that's happening with the suicides. And they find another similar case from months earlier where another person had committed suicide and they go to research it, which means they go to a Korean immigrant's home and his wife was the one who had committed suicide and they find out who is giving out the loan. So if you remember... Um, we know that there is a lender that is associated with the people who are committing suicide. Well, what we learn here is that as they interview this Korean immigrant, they figure out who's giving out the loans and how that's working. So basically what's happening is 
this lending company is is pressuring people to commit suicide, but we don't know exactly why they're doing that yet. Well, that will be revealed later in this episode. Samantha's boss finds out that she's starting a club, the one that she has already been fantasizing about and put a down payment on, and that she will likely steal his girls. So he has the whole escort service, and she will likely take some of those women and move them into her club. And so then he he confronts her, but then he also goes and asks the Yakuza to confront her so that he doesn't have to deal with her competition, basically. Um, Kirigara uh, beats a Tazawa prisoner and gets him to give up the rat that exists within Chihara, the Chihara gang. But we don't know who that rat is. In fact, that won't even be revealed in this particular episode. But he gives that to Jake, and then Jake is able to um, use that to give back to Ishida. Jake and Amy then visit the bad lender and discover that the lender forces the borrowers to sign a document as a part of their loan paperwork that turns their life insurance policy over in the event they can't pay the loan. Okay. So when they sign up to get a loan, they also basically sign a document saying that a life insurance policy that was taken out on them will be turned over to the lender if the if the borrower cannot pay the lender back. Now this gives us a really good idea of what's happening here. This is why people are committing suicide. This is why the the lender is harassing the borrowers who can't pay back to commit suicide because if they commit suicide, guess what? If they commit suicide, then the lender gets their money, gets their life insurance policy money. So that's why this is this is this pretty insane thing to learn about how this is working and how this is going about. We then also see a scene where a private eye is after Samantha based on some crime that she's committed, although we're not told what that is yet. Um, and then we also see a, a really minor scene where Aimee is, uh, so Jake's boss, is also pursuing another criminal case, but we don't know much about it yet. It has something to do with women who are being killed. So we don't know really too much about that, but we do know that she's actually researching another case on top of the one that she's working on with Jake. Jake and Sato then later go to a club, pick up prostitutes, except Jake doesn't actually realize that they were prostitutes at first until afterwards, and then Sato pays them, essentially. And then uh, Jake and Sato then go out to dinner at a really nice restaurant, and Jake encounters some of the Tozawa higher-ups. And he actually confronts them in that scene, but it really doesn't go anywhere uh, although he does learn, he does see a couple people. He sees one of the the, the Tazawa accountant and um, and one of the higher ups in in the Tazawa gaming as well. And so that so that gives us contact context for how that situation is kind of working out. The episode then ends with Samantha wondering what to do about her problems. So that's a quick recap of Tokyo Vice episode four. Now, as a, as a review, my feelings on the episode, I would say that episode four was an average episode, which means it was very good. I mean, it was average for this show, um, and this show is very good. So I, I do recommend watching this show. Episode four was also a really good episode. All the storylines are getting more complicated, especially now with Samantha's storyline slightly changing um, because we're, we're, they've given her a reason to be um, – more conflict to be in her life, right? She's she's now more anxious because this private eye is investigating her or pressuring her at least at this point. And that's all pretty interesting. I think that that's a new twist that's added in that's really compelling. It makes me wonder, it makes me want to read the memoir of Jake Adelstein's memoir because I start to wonder if that's, how much of this is actually true because this, the, the story is getting pretty complex, pretty complicated. So I thought it was a solid episode that focused on a lot of relationship building and explanation about kind of what's going on. We're still sort of in, we're moving out of setup mode into, you know, into what you'd call like the act two part of the narrative where there's lots of conflict. And I think this was a good episode for driving some of that home. Uh, the big reveal obviously was that the lender was forcing the borrowers to sign a life insurance policy so that now we know why they were committing suicide because there was so much societal pressure put on them. And then the, the, the lender was harassing them, putting pressure on this guilt and shame honor culture. And so the borrowers felt so, so bad that they couldn't pay the loans back that they end up committing suicide so that the lender actually benefits by taking the life insurance policy money. So which that is a a horrific thing to do. I mean, talk about extortion. Um, 
that's like the epitome of extortion, right? Like it's really bad. And then of course the big twist in this episode was that Samantha is a criminal who's being hunted down by a private eye. And that was, you know, something that I did not really expect to get. So again, uh, I would say about this episode that it was average, which is very good for Tokyo. I mean, Tokyo Vice is a great show. So definitely something you should watch. And we had some really big reveals and it looks like we're setting ourselves up for even bigger reveals down the road, which is really fantastic. Now, as far as uh, the breakdown of this episode goes, let's get into that. The first thing to really break down is the reveal that the lender um, associated with the suicides had the rights to the dead people's life insurance policy payouts. So they get the money if someone dies. And that's why the lender was harassing their borrowers to the point where they were ashamed and they were committing suicide. So this is now, this is striking because as someone who lives in the U.S., I can't really imagine very many times that this technique would have worked, at least not very often. I don't think this technique would have worked very often on American borrowers. I don't know if we have enough of an honor and shame culture for somebody to harass us to the point where we would commit suicide. Um, now, I do think that Samantha, as somebody who is an expat American – we see her guilt come up when she, when we realize that she, a sin she has committed, a crime she has committed, may be found out. So I'm going to get into this later when I talk about kind of this version of noir that we're seeing here that I really like. But that is sort of more of a Western guilt complex. Like I hide the thing I'm bad at, and if that's revealed, then I'm in big trouble, right? So um, interesting, interesting to see that this technique by these lenders pressuring people to commit suicide. Interesting to see that that would work in this culture because I'm not sure it would work in the Western culture. It may work in some instances, but not as not as often as it's working here in the show. But, base, but again, this is based off Jake Adelstein's actual memoir. So this is likely true. This is likely taken right out of that memoir. I have not read that memoir, but I'm assuming that this case is one of the cases that he pursued as, an, as a journalist, and that's what the show is about because he discovered this about you know, how the Yakuza was was doing this to people. And then as I talked about with both Mike Gordon and with Dale Wentland, this gets really into honor and shame culture and how that exists in Japan. Again, different than some of the issues that the U.S. would have. These issues are separate because each society has its own ways of behaving. Each society has things about it that are great and things about it that people can manipulate. And in this case... One of the things that's being manipulated is people's ability to pay their debts. And I think this is pretty eye-opening, at least to me it is, right? This is that, that someone could be this nefarious about this kind of thing is very intense. Very, very intense. Now, this episode also revealed that it's not just Jake who doesn't understand the Japanese culture. Sato and Jake's co-workers, because Jake asked them about... I want it that way. The song, the Backstreet Boys song, I want it that way, and what it means. Um, and both Sato and Jake's coworkers all misinterpret that song. Uh, it's not about what they think it's about. At least Jake doesn't think it's what they think it's about. It's probably not what they think it's about. They think it's some kind of kinky sex thing. <laughs> and uh, that's funny. So, so that's showcased really well with humor that we may not understand fully Japanese culture, but Japanese culture doesn't actually understand fully Western culture either. And, you know, that's part of what this whole show is is playing with. And a lot of shows like this play with similar things. But let's talk about Tokyo Vice, the show thus far, four episodes in, and how it utilizes noir, specifically detective noir. And I love detective noir. It's one of the it's one of the genres that I read pretty frequently. And um, one of the things I think that embodies detective noir, which is present in Tokyo Vice as well, is that it's all about everyone having secrets and having issues in their life and that everybody essentially has a vice and those vices get manipulated, right? That's sort of what detective noir is all about. It's people who have something that they desire that they shouldn't desire they act on that desire, it gets them in trouble, and then they're manipulated or, or a situation is manipulated, and it's really, really fascinating. So if you think about 
people not being perfect, Detective Noir showcases what happens when that imperfection gets manipulated. The head boss of Tozawa has a medical condition which seems to be driving him to be more reckless. He wants to leave a legacy and he knows he's going to die anyway, so he might as well go to war with the rival Chihara gang, right? So that's an issue in his life. It's a vice that he's, and he's keeping it a secret. He's hiding it from people. He's putting on makeup. And that secret is causing him to act in a way that causes problems to happen in his community. Um, we know that Detective Kirigara is using violence to get info, info from the Tazawa gang member. We know that he probably should not be doing that. He's going a little bit uh, off book there to do some of those things. And we also know that he's already disagreed with his supervisors about how they should go about solving cases. So he's keeping some secrets or ways of behaving that society might not agree with. He's keeping those to himself as well. Ishida might be losing the respect of his gang. He's the head of the Chihara gang, the Chihara family, the Yakuza. And he might be losing the respect of his gang because they think, there's a rumor going around that they think he is a police informant. So now he's carrying a secret that he has to deal with, right? And he's pushed to behave differently because of that. Jake is desperate to make a name for himself. He's driven by that desire. It's a vice for him. It can get him in trouble. Um, Sato used to be a fishmonger and wanted a better life, so he joined the Yakuza. And now the Yakuza kind of demands him to do things that he would not otherwise want to do. And, of course, in this episode, we get the big reveal that Samantha has committed a crime. So now Samantha is somebody who can be manipulated as well. So this gives all of this cast of characters a very compelling reasons for pushing the conflict. Um, and, and I didn't even mention uh, Aimee. She, she, we know that she's actually a gaijin. She's not from Japan. She's Korean. We learned that a little bit more in this episode where she talks to the Korean immigrant. And so this gives a lot of people compelling reasons to get involved in conflicts and to push that conflict forward. And we all know that Conflict is one of the bedrocks for storytelling and what makes people interested in storytelling. And that's why this is such a huge strength of Detective Noir. This idea that we would be, we would all be associated and embroiled in, in conflict and that we would keep secrets and that those secrets would create more conflict that would double down. All of those things are really, really fascinating and I think really well done here. And how do then storytellers specifically writers, but also directors or anybody else in, in, in involved in the storytelling process. How do they exploit that? Well, they give characters weaknesses that those characters are trying to keep a secret. The same thing is true if you look at more of like uh, U.S. Detective Noir. U.S. Detective Noir is almost always focused in Los Angeles, San Francisco, or... Um, New York. Those are some of the more common areas where it's showcased. And one of the shows about uh, the Los Angeles area, one of the movies, I should say, is Chinatown. Really classic detective noir. And that's the system is corrupt. This The government system and how they go about doling out water resources, that's kind of what that's about. But as the detective in that movie, played by Jack Nicholson, I can't remember the character's name, but he's played by Jack Nicholson. As he investigates these crimes, what he realizes is that all the people involved also have additional secrets. In fact, the the big secret in the end of the in, at the end of the movie, which I won't spoil, is all about a family secret that that people have been keeping um, under wraps, you know, they don't want to get out. And that secret is almost worse than what's happening systemically in that in that city in LA. So it's a neat, it, so this is a technique that works in all kinds of stories, but it really shines in Detective Noir, and Detective Noir really manipulates that really, really well. And a lot of times too, the detective involved in is usually a private eye, but the detective or the private eye involved in unraveling all these secrets usually has some weaknesses or secrets of his own or her own that are also manipulated, <laughs> right? Maybe they fall in love with the person that they, or maybe fall in lust would be a better word for it, with the person that they're helping. 
and then that causes problems. I mean, it's, this is the kind of thing that um, Detective Noir does really, really, really well. And Tokyo Vice is certainly a part of that legacy of great det- Detective Noir. And I am really enjoying this, this show. I will get to episode five later, probably next week. I know we're already, there are, I think, seven episodes that have been released. So I got to still catch up on some of those. Having a great time doing it so far. Really recommend Tokyo Vice to anybody who has not seen it yet. And that brings me to the last segment of today's show, which is Death of a Bounty Hunter. Death of a Bounty Hunter, the full cast audiobook version. Um, You'll remember me saying that Death of a Bounty Hunter was actually written to be a full cast audiobook. That was the intent of us putting it out, was that it would be a full cast audiobook. It is also a novel that you can buy right now. But we have an official release date for the final version of our full cast audiobook. That is uh, 14 characters voiced by 11 voice performers. So it's really cool. If you like podcasts, if you like listening to podcasts, if you like, you know, this is a, I would call this as a, um, you know, steampunk, dark fantasy western. But it has some noir elements in it too, of course, because that's just something that influences a lot of my own writing. And if you want to listen to that, it is coming out May 2nd. The official release date is May 2nd, and it should be available wherever you buy um, audiobooks. But if you want to buy it um, on our private podcast feed, which is the best way to buy it from us just because it's the easiest way for us to recoup our investment. We get a higher percentage of the profits if you buy it through our private podcast feed. You can go over to deathofabountyhunter.com and buy it over there as of May 2nd. As of May 2nd. So definitely go check that out. Um, It was such a fun book to put together. You've heard a little bit of it already. I will continue talking about it in segments on the Story Geek Show. And you'll get to hear a little bit more. I'm hoping to have some of our actors and actresses on the show with me. And we can act out some of the... Some of the book. I'm also looking to have a release party at some point, probably later in May. And uh, if you if you want to show up to that release party, you can, you know, hopefully I'll get some of the actors to the actors actors and actresses who are present to act out some of the scenes. That'd be really fun. But that is it for today's show. Don't forget, new episodes of the Story Geek Show come out on every Tuesday and every Thursday. On Thursday, this coming Thursday, April 28th, I will have my first in studio guest. In fact, if you're watching. This version of the show, you'll notice that my backdrop is a little different. I normally sit over there. Um, I'm pointing on the camera. Um, but I uh, rearranged the studio because I'm going to have my first in-studio guest. Mike Biondo will be visiting, and he's going to hang out with me to discuss his favorite film, The Blues Brothers. So we're going to go back into the 80s and talk about The Blues Brothers Plus, I'll have a breakdown of Moon Knight, episode five, to go over. So I'll add that to the conversation as well. I don't know if Mike's watching Moon Knight, so he might not be a part of that, but I will be breaking that down. Subscribe to The Story Geek Show on YouTube or your preferred podcast provider. If you don't have time to watch on YouTube, you can always download the audio version and take it with you. I try to do as much as I can to describe not just the visuals um, that I might put on the screen, but also describe those to you so you can just listen to the audio version and be good to go. All episodes are published to the podcast feed right after I finish recording them here on YouTube. Leave me a comment and let me know what you thought of Tokyo Vice, or maybe you want to let me know what you think Lucifer's motivation was. Either way, leave me a comment, let me know, and I will see you on Thursday.